Well, a warm welcome to this talk, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, James Roguski uh, from uh, California, I believe, James. Welcome. That is, that is correct. I'm in the Los Angeles area. Thank you so very much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share some information. It's a very early morning for you, so, so thanks for getting up early for us. I've been, I've been talking to people all around the world about this. It is a worldwide thing, and so um, actually it's perfect timing. Um, let's, let's get into it. Yeah, j j just tell us, you, so we're talking about the WHO Treaty, the International Health Regulation. Um, what is your, in a nutshell, James, your main concern here? My, my main concern is that they're negotiating under fraudulent premise that um, what, what is going on are, are three separate things, really, that we need to talk about. And before anyone should even think about changing international law, I think it would be really helpful if they stopped and actually you know, had a, a commission or an inquiry or an investigation to actually learn something from the last four years rather than just double down and multiply the mistakes and make it far worse um, by just plowing forward without learning lessons from all of the things that have happened over the last four years. Yeah. So the World Health Organization is just going on trying to assume these more centralized powers without really lessing, learning the lessons from the pandemic, because a lot of people think the WHO didn't do that well through the pandemic, actually. And, and so starting out with the, the details of the different topics, okay, most people are absolutely completely unaware that last May, on May 27th, 2022, during the World Health Assembly, a, a set of amendments to international regulations were adopted, okay? And along with that are uh, rules in the international health regulations that every nation has 18 months to reject them. You could just send a letter to the WHO and say, no, thank you. But here's what the problem is, and it goes all the way back to 1948. Many people talk about, you know, will this or won't this cause nations to lose their sovereignty? And, and they're missing the big picture. Um, sovereignty and power was shifted from parliament or Congress or the Senate over to an appointed delegate in each nation. And so there is no... Um, connection between people and the people who are purporting to represent us. And so what has happened is a brand new bureaucracy was set up in 1948 or whenever any nation joined. And so people think, oh, well, I'm going to speak to my representative in parliament or in Congress, and they're going to be able to do something about it. But way back in 1948, certainly in the United States, the balance of power or, or the um, checks and balances between the legislative branch and, and the executive branch got shifted. And so what people don't understand is the amendments that were adopted last year are not like a treaty. They're amendments to an existing agreement, and there will be no signature needed. There will be no um, vote in Parliament or Congress or the Senate. The structure of how this operates is it is assumed that you're okay with what your delegate agreed to unless you proactively reject them under Article 61 in the IHR. And so that is the opposite of what everyone has been talking about because the treaty that they're talking about, which really I'm, I'm going to try my best to continue to call that a framework convention because that seems where they're headed. They did a very similar thing in 2003 with the Framework Convention for the Control of Tobacco. But, but coming back to the amendments that were adopted last year, there's an 18-month period where every nation has the opportunity to just say no. And we've wasted 12 months. There's been just absolute silence. As far as I can tell, not a single politician anywhere in the world um, has spoken a word about it. So we do have six months left. And um, in Canada, in the UK, in Australia so far, um, you know, good people have stepped up and uh, put in petitions because those nations do have a petition system. Um, Tess Laurie in the UK put forth a petition so that it would be um, debated in Parliament. 
Um, if you go to uk.stoptheamendments.com, you can sign the petition if you agree with it and want this to be discussed, because silence equals consent. And that's the difference. People are focused on the treaty, and the treaty arguably, and, and there's details to the contrary, but arguably a treaty would be reviewed by Parliament and the people would have a say, but that is absolutely not the case with these amendments. So the international health regulations that were actually approved on the 27th of May 2022, they'll come into force in six months' time unless someone actually stops them. What, what is in those that, that provisional set of amendments, uh, James? I'll, I'll, I'll tweak that just a little tiny bit. The period to reject them is 18 months from last May, so that would be the end of November. They wouldn't actually come into force until six months after that, which would be um, May of 2024. And what, what that primarily did was there were a number of amendments that I exposed back in March of 2022 that the Biden administration had proposed. That document from the United States was completely ignored. It was not brought up for a vote or any such thing. But in the middle of last year's assembly, a number of nations, the United States, the European Union, and the United Kingdom sponsored a different set of amendments. There were amendments to five articles, and the main important one was a change to Article 59 of the International Health Regulations, which would seek to shorten the time period that future amendments would then be, you know, you'd have an opportunity to reject them or they would go into force. So the changes that are winding their way through this 18-month period would change that 18-month period down to 10 months. They had tried to get it all the way down to six months. They were negotiating. They said nine. They ended up settling on 10 months. So if that had been in effect for last year, we would have already missed the opportunity to reject them, and time would have been up. They also changed the um, time period from 24 months to 12 months that it would actually go into legally binding effect. So they're, they're tightening the schedule down for the next round of amendments. But the bigger issue, just to repeat, the time frame is important and all of the details of the amendments that are being negotiated now are important, but it's important to understand that unelected, unaccountable, unknown delegates who meet in Geneva are empowered to make the decision and then it is assumed that you're okay with it unless you proactively reject it. And it's not the people or the parliament who have the authority to do that. It's just the, whatever leader it is in your nation that has authority to communicate with the WHO. Now, in every nation that may be different, but um, that difference is a, a, a cognitive problem. People have cognitive dissonance about, well, you know, somebody's going to have to approve this. No, it's acceptance by acquiescence. You know, your silence is consent. If you don't say no, or, or rather I should say, if President Biden doesn't say no, or if your prime minister doesn't say no, then it's just going to go through. And unfortunately, both the United States government and the UK government were the ones who sponsored this, and nobody ever told the people. And once these amendments come into force, I've had lots of people say, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to follow these. I, I'm going to skip out of these. But this this will be legally enforceable, won't it? Well, again, now we have to separate so as to not get confused. Um, the, the amendments that were done last year were not the all encompassing problematic amendments that people have been talking about. The amendments last year primarily just shortened the time period that you would be able to reject them and they would come into force faster. So let's let's like draw a line in the sand in our in our discussion right now. You know, there are things that people can do in the United Kingdom. You could go to uk.stoptheamendments.com, sign a petition there. Um, you can go to australia.stoptheamendments.com to sign the petition there. Um, unfortunately, you've missed the opportunity to go to canada.stoptheamendments.com but they only needed 500 signatures, and I think they got almost 19,000 in 30 days. In the UK, 
um, you need 100,000 because you have larger population. And it would um, result in a public discussion of this amendment situation. So now moving forward into the second issue, which are the amendments that um, were um, first made public in mid-December. But I'd like to rewind just a little bit to give the explanation of how this all came to be. Last May, in addition to adopting the amendments that we've been discussing, the World Health Assembly also adopted a, a plan to encourage other nations to uh, you know, update the um, international health regulations. And so they said to all the nations, by September 30th, please submit any proposed amendments. So on September 30th, or a little bit thereafter, a couple of nations were late, um, uh, there was 197 pages of proposed amendments. They tallied them up. There were 307 specific amendments to the international health regulations. They pretty much kept that completely secret until mid-December. And they revealed them in mid-December. I reported on it. Um, you know, people have learned about them. And, and so we're certainly not going to cover all um, 307 amendments you know, now I hope we can cover some of them, but I think the question was, um, and, and correct me if I'm mis misremembering the question, you know, what effect is that going to have? How is that going to be enforced? And, you know, is it going to mm. take away our sovereignty and, and, and so forth? Well, the, the actual answer to that is very similar to what we talked about before with an added twist from Russia, okay? And so the issue is, the power to approve or disprove, disapprove them or, or you know, fail to approve them or reject them has been taken away from the people and their representatives and has been shifted to the executive branch in most governments. And, and so it's not the case that any of those amendments are going to be reviewed by parliament or voted on in any kind of referendum or any such thing. The power was shifted back in 1948, and it was enforced again in 1969 when the international health regulations were agreed to. And so it's your executive branch of your government that will be required to enforce the agreements or, or the, the obligations under the agreements. Now, this isn't normally where I start, but because it's your question, Russia proposed an amendment to Article 4 of the International Health Regulations. And you can dig up the 197-page document and scroll down to Russia, and you'll see that they, um, if, if the amendments were to be adopted, it would require the um, government of each nation to enact legislation, or that could come in the effect of you know, a regulation from some ministry or agency or it could be an executive order, you know, however they might implement it, the nations would be obligated to enact legislation to have something called the International Health Regulations Focal Point, which I bet you didn't know you had one of those, John. Okay. Every nation has a it national knows. a national IHR focal point, and their current um, job, their their obligation is if there is some kind of an outbreak in the nation, um, they are supposed to be in 24-7 communication with the WHO. And if, if there's a problem, and it could be you know, a, a worldwide problem, if there's some sort of pathogen or a you know, um, chemical spill or radiation leak or something like that, they're supposed to immediately alert the WHO and start the process of alerting the world. Okay. Well, everyone has an office in their nation that has that connection to the WHO, but they would, they would require expanding the authority of that IHR focal point to enforce the obligations that have been agreed to if the delegate agrees to any subsequent amendments. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the many different amendments. And I'll try to touch on three or four real quick if, if you think that's the next thing I, I, I should probably do. Yeah, no, no, I'd like to do that. But I mean, it's, this is just incredible. So we've got we've got 
decision makers in Russia, working through unelected bureaucrats in the World Health Organization, working through unelected bureaucrats in the United Kingdom and the United States to enforce laws on you and me. That's the sound right. <laughs> exactly. And, and so, you know, some of, some of the... Incredible. Some, some of the um, proposed amendments were jaw-dropping. I, I, I still recall... Yeah, let's go for, go for those, James, please. I, I was sitting right where I was sitting right now when I first read it, and I saw my jaw just hang open. I couldn't believe what I was reading, yeah. but it's all in print. All I'm doing yeah. is pointing out, you know, their documents. So um, Bangladesh proposed uh, a change to Article 1, and Article 1 is just all of the definitions. And in that, I think you're aware of this. I think you've already reported on this. The current definition of a standing or a temporary recommendation is that it's non-binding advice. Well, that's what a recommendation is. Everybody knows that, okay? Well, they would cross out the words non-binding, but coupled with other um, proposed... Well, they just crossed out the word none and left in binding, didn't they? Well, actually, they, they crossed out non-binding. So in and of itself, it, it's just saying that recommendations mm -hmm. are advice, and, and so... Other nations have put forth a multitude of, you know, 307 amendments, but the clearest one is from Malaysia, where mm -hmm. they said um, the standing and temporary recommendations under Articles 15 and 16 shall be implemented as soon as possible, okay? Well, shall in law means you have to. And so don't take it from me. Read the... Um, International Health Regulations Review Committee's final report, I'll explain that in a minute, they said, well, hold on just a minute, okay, something ain't right. Um, if you're going to change the definition of the word recommendation and make it an obligation, that changes the whole nature of the WHO and the IHRs. And that right there, and it's not just one thing, it's the change of the definition and then the wording in multiple, multiple amendments that plays off on that language change. I mean, we're talking to 1984 Newspeak, you know, war is peace and love is hate and up is down and left is right. And recommendations are orders. OK, if you're going to change the definition of a fundamental word in the English language for purposes of the IHR, is it any wonder that everybody's confused? OK, so moving on, because that's pretty darn bad right out of the gate that's article number one let's just change the meaning of the word recommendation article number two currently defines the scope of the ihr the, the international health regulations the scope says if there's an emergency then you know the ihr has come into play well what's an emergency okay we won't get into you know money pox and all the different things that happen but um the Director General is, in many ways, um, a dictator general. And so if he says there's an emergency, then gosh darn it, there's an emergency. Well, they've actually expanded on, they've actually expanded on that and changed the wording in many different amendments, not just this one, um, to state if there is the potential for an emergency, then he can declare a public health emergency of international concern P-H-E-I-C, or fake, okay? They also want to let the regional directors, there's six regions in the WHO, they want all of the unelected, I mean, pardon me, John, but do you know who your regional director is in the WHO European region? I mean, I don't even know who it is in the United States no. region. Well, that person would be empowered to declare a public health emergency of regional concern. So not only do they want to fake you, they want to FERC you, right? And, and so that it expands the scope of just the fear-mongering possibilities, right? All right, let's get to number three, which is the one that just made my jaw fall down through the floor. Um, India proposed crossing out language in Article 3, and I think you've probably even reported on this one as well. Um, when I read the international health regulations for the first time last year, and I got to Article 3, and it said that the regulations shall be implemented with full respect for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of people. I, I took a breath and I said, no, well, that doesn't sound so bad. 
Let me let me keep reading, right? I'm I'm okay with that. There's a there's a bunch of things in the current IHRs that I'm not happy with, and I would like to make some amendments, but it wasn't that one. And so when I read that India would cross those words out, they would cross out um, with full respect for the dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms of people. And you can read their document and the lines going right through the words. I was slack jawed. I was slack jawed. I was like, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, James, you know, um, I'm an optimist. That's a blessing. That is so egregiously just flat out wrong. Okay. Well, yeah. it, it, it maybe wasn't a mistake. And you, anyone can see that is outrageous. A, a, anybody who sees that and says, oh, yeah, okay, uh, I'm tired of all that pesky dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. That's been bothering me. I want to get rid of that. Let me hand it over to you. Um, yeah. I, I haven't met that person yet. I hope they call me. Okay. But um, this past week, um, on Monday the 22nd, there was a roundtable meeting about the amendments and the regulations. And actually, they're also bringing in the United Nations, which is something we probably won't have time to talk about. Um, the uh, representative, or, or I should say the co-chair of the working group for the amendments to the international health regulations, um, is from Saudi Arabia. He was speaking you know, from the table at this roundtable meeting, and he said something that again, made my jaw fall. He said that we have to restrict rights when there's an emergency. And I was just like, he actually said that in public out loud for everyone to hear. Okay. And so now maybe in some cultures, um, they feel that that's appropriate. Okay. But anyone who believes in, you know, the rights that are handed down to you from your creator understands that emergency be damned. Okay. We all have unalienable rights and, you know, we can cooperate and you can ask me to do something, but you do not have the right to, you know, do a, a variety of things that in, in, include the decisions that I'm, ama I'm allowed to, to make with what I do with my body. But for someone to say in public, that your rights must be restricted during an emergency. I'll be a little bold here, John. That man should be removed from his position. That is absolutely unacceptable to have the co-chair of the working group for amendments to the international health regulations have that attitude to the point where he could actually say those words in public. But it's not just an emergency. It's it's when the when the director general says there's an emergency or a potential emergency or one of these bureaucrats. That, I mean, you, can, you know, anyone can say there's an emergency at any time on on virtually any grounds. Uh, you, exactly. That's my whole point. Is if you're if you're going to give yourself the power to say that there's an emergency because you say there's an emergency. we got to go all the way back to the Roman Empire. I believe that's where the language began. Um, a dictator was the person who would dictate orders. You know, uh, you know a, a fine, upstanding you know, person who is respected by the community. Um, you know, I've personally worked in situations, not, you know, crisis emergencies, but, you know, you got a job, you got to do it quickly. Things got to be organized. You got to, you know, direct and dictate and delegate, but you don't tell somebody to do something that's against their moral fiber. You don't tell them to violate their religious beliefs or do something that they feel the risk outweighs the benefit. You, you direct traffic, you dictate orders, you make things happen with respect, not, you know, dictatorial totalitarian control um, over what you do. And so the, the definition of a dictator comes from the person who's put in charge to dictate orders when there's an emergency. And so they seem to have realized that if they can keep an ongoing, you know, permanent state of emergency, the United States, last time I checked, is operating under, I, I forget the number now, it's probably changed. It was over 40 states of emergency that have been declared and they just keep renewing them. So the president of the United States has emergency powers for all of these many things. And then you wonder why your rights are being trampled on emergency or not. Respect for human rights is a given. And if they could put into writing and speak in public 
that they want to you know get rid of those rights, I think that ought to grab people's attention. Now, there's one more amendment that I, I want to, or, or pile of amendments that I, I would like to talk about. The European Union as a group has mm. proposed a number of um, amendments that fall under the category of a global digital health certification network. Now, it's not just the UK. There's also nations in Africa and India and Russia and Indonesia. And the, the clue about this was given by the Indonesian health minister at the B20 um, back in November. He said that Indonesia was proud. They wanted to put forth amendments to um, make it so that, uh, and, and he proceeded to tell what I think are a number of lies. Okay? He said, well, you remember back in 2020 when we had to lock down the world? It's like, well, um, that was a choice. You didn't have to take that action. You're responsible for that choice. And then he said, well, you know, that, um, that hurt the economy. It's like, well, yes, but it mostly hurt the big box, you know, Amazon, Walmart, the big stores. It didn't, it, it, it didn't hurt them. It hurt the small mom and pop stores. Then he said, well, you know, what we want to do is have a um, vaccine certificate, a prophylaxis certificate, a testing certificate, a um, recovery certificate, so that if you're properly vaccinated, which there's a question there, I'll just leave it at that, or if you're properly tested, which might even be a bigger question, then you can move around. Okay, well, excuse me, but I can move around if I want to move around because that's my inalienable right to not be forced to do anything to my body, you know, even stick something up my nose. Um, because number one, the things that, you know, might test or um, protect or prevent transmission or whatever, you know, those things are very questionable. And, and does the risk outweigh the benefit or does the benefit outweigh the risk? That's an individual decision. Okay. And so my concern, I have a whole website dedicated to it, is that um, that's the start of the global digital ID tracking and tracing China social credit system. Um, I actually have um, in my possession a little vaccine passport. My girlfriend traveled back in the 1970s, and this form is actually in Annex 6 of the International Health Regulations. They want to dramatically expand that and digitize it so that everybody gets a unique um, QR code. And before you book your flight, um, you're not going to be able to if your QR code gives you a, a, a red light instead of a green light. And with some of the things that we're going to talk about with the treaty, um, you might need one of those for your companion animal. If you're bringing your, your service dog on the flight, um, they're concerned with the One Health concept that, you know, zoonotic transfer is, is you know, treacherous. And that's where all pandemics are coming from. Uh, you know, I'm not saying that they're implementing that yet for your pets. But that's the type of thing that they're talking about wanting to monitor. And so let, let's draw another line in the sand, if we can, John. Um, the amendments that are currently being negotiated, these 307 amendments from 94 nations, the United Kingdom did not submit any. To my knowledge, nothing. They, they may have been involved in the negotiations, but one might ask, um, if a nation did not submit any proposed changes to the IHR, wouldn't that mean that they thought that they were okay the way they were, unless they were cooperating with other nations, you know, to, to do it on their behalf? Um, to my knowledge, the UK did not submit, you know, an initial batch of amendments. They did submit the ones last year, but um, where's the um, concern that all of the other nations are forcing these regulations on a nation that said, hey, everything's fine, leave it alone. Okay, so the... Just say something about the control of information and the, def uh, the definitions of disinformation that the, uh, the World Health Organization will be able to dictate to the rest of us, James. Well, that's actually in the treaty. And so that's one of the areas where people get it all confused. Okay, um, there's one or two lines about that in the proposed amendments. 
So um, we'll transition just so everybody can compartmentalize in their mind everything we've been talking about so far. Okay, and this is what the um, um, petition in the UK and in Australia are about. Everything we've said so far could be adopted by the delegates and it could be subsequently rejected by the leader of any nation. But the authority to reject the amendments has been taken away from Congress or the Senate or Parliament all the way back in 1948 and in 1969. So any discussion of the amendments, if somebody says, oh, you know, Parliament will dis, you know, have, have a chance to weigh in on that, um, the only way to fix this problem really is to exit the WHO because the authority has been granted. And in the United States, that's exactly what we're doing. You can go to exitthewho.com and, and see the legislation to revoke the entry because that is where the transfer of authority went from the people and the legislature to the executive branch. Okay, now let's change the mindset and talk about the treaty. Okay, and it goes by many names. Um, they have called it a convention agreement or other international instrument. Most people have referred to it as the pandemic treaty. They've been calling it the pandemic accord. I'm going to call it what I want to call it because everybody's calling it what they want to call it. I actually downloaded the framework convention for the control of tobacco, which is a very similar something that the WHO put into place in 2003. And I was shocked at the similarity. It's like they cut and pasted the framework convention for tobacco control and started with that as a template, the layout, the font, the, the you know, details of a lot of it. It certainly seems like they know what they're doing. They did it before they cut and pasted it. They put it in place and then they started editing it. Um, now, I don't know if they did that, but it certainly looks that way. And so a framework convention makes everybody's head hurt. It's like, what the heck does that mean? Okay. People know what a treaty is. Usually you have a war and at the end of the war, you know, you divvy up the territory and you end the war and you move on. Okay. Um, a framework convention is a nefarious little thing in my mind. You find some language that you can agree to and you, you make it so that people get into the agreement but it's just a framework. It's kind of like a Christmas tree. You put a Christmas tree in your living room and then you start hanging or ornaments on it. Okay. Oh, well let's, let's hang this protocol on the framework convention. Well, when do you, when do you do that? You do that after everybody's agreed to the framework. Okay. Well, you know, what if people wanted to put different ornaments than you, you know, if you've envisioned how you would decorate your Christmas tree, and you go, yeah, let's get a Christmas tree. But then somebody comes in and starts putting different ornaments than you expected. You're like, wait a minute. That's not what I, sorry. Now here's, here's the problem. What we discussed earlier is even worse in the treaty. Um, you can read the first couple of pages of the treaty. It all sounds nice and wonderful. Sovereignty and freedom and equity and inclusivity and all that sort of thing. Don't fall for that. You know, that's how they get you to not read the whole darn thing. You could read the body of it and we could talk about how they want to do a pathogen um, access and benefit sharing program where they want all of the pathogens and genomic sequences to be sent to the hub in Geneva. You can talk about how they want 20% of all of the um, uh, pandemic response products made to be either donated or given at affordable price to the WHO. You can talk about Article 18, which is what you mentioned, which is the censorship and the literally tack, they have to tackle um, myths and disinformation. But I encourage everybody to go to chapter three on page 31 for the remainder of the document, because that is where you lose your sovereignty. And the manner in which that would occur is like a Russian nested Maristroika doll. Okay. It's bureaucracy inside of bureaucracy inside of bureaucracy, and you can't penetrate the layers. They would set up 
if the treaty were to be adopted by the various adopted by the assembly and then signed on to by the various nations they would become party to the treaty so there would be a bureaucracy constructed which would be the conference of the parties you probably are familiar with that with climate change they have a cop 27 they're going to have a cop 28 you know stop the cop okay cop stands for conference of the parties which is a bureaucracy that when the treaty is agreed to and i, I will call it a framework convention um, when that framework is laid out the boss the new boss is the conference of the parties well who chooses them who are they they've listed three separate committees and a panel of experts who would be in charge of implementing the different agreements in the treaty and that is where you lose control okay we've we've lost control by getting into the who where delegates are allowed under article 19 and 20 of the who constitution to enact a convention or an agreement that's where the ca plus comes from it comes from the wording in the who's constitution article 19 and 20 so the um uh, the world health assembly is empowered by the constitution of the who to adopt a convention well when they adopt the convention and they pass on authority to the conference of the parties to then hang ornaments on your christmas tree to add protocols to the agreement how do you stop those protocols and you're not even going to know that they happen do you know all of the protocols that they've put in place for the cop one two three four five six to, through 28 it, no it's, idea it's so far away from the will of the people that you know it's it's dictatorial control it might be oligarchic it might not be you know one dictator it might not just be tedros it's this unknown, unaccountable, unelected band of authority figures who have been given authority when um, our representatives back in 1948 and 1969 and 2005 weren't paying attention and they uh, approved something or they remained silent and just let it slide on in. Um, this is how they slowly, in a creeping fashion, are working for the long run. Oh, give us, you know, authority to make decisions for you in the future. And I say no. Okay. And so the, the thing I really want to talk about, and it's the important thing, and we talked a little bit about it, is none of this should be happening because it's all predicated on a decision that was made in 2021 at the assembly there they decided to have a special session of the assembly in late November December 2021 I'm gonna guess most people didn't get a memo about that you didn't get to weigh in with your delegate at late November 2021 what they ended up deciding was that oh we need to have a treaty do we okay well I, nobody asked me, right? Well, if you can teleport yourself back to your mindset in late November of 2021, okay? We had a year of COVID, 2020, and then we had a year of jabs, and 11 months in, end of November, beginning of December, the attitude at the time, okay? And I can forgive anybody for any, you know, information that they got that was, you know, time sensitive or misinformation or incomplete or whatever, but the general zeitgeist, the general idea that was floating around at the time was, oh, these jabs are great. And they're going to save the world. And we're going to get back to normal. And so Europe and Canada and America and, and Australia and New Zealand and other nations, they bought up 10 times what they needed. Okay. And so many nations at the time who were under the illusion that they were being shortchanged because they weren't getting enough and, and it was being all kept by the nations who bought up 10 times more than they needed. They were upset 
and they said, this isn't fair. We want equity. Okay. They, they felt they weren't being treated fairly because all of the other nations were hogging, you know, what they thought was good stuff. Well, count your blessings and be careful what you ask for, because the fact that they didn't get all of those may have turned out to be a blessing. But the mindset that triggered the process to create a treaty has not shifted. They are still of the mindset, if anybody reads the bulk of the treaty, it reads to me like a venture capital prospectus. They're going to have a, um, a, um, um, a logistics network. They're going to have a pa uh, pathogen access and benefit sharing system. What does that mean, PABS? What is PABS? Okay. Well, if you find a pathogen because you stuck something up somebody's nose or you take a sample somewhere or you do some genomic sequencing, um, you know, share that, you know, everybody wants to have access to that information because that information is valuable. That's, you know, that becomes intellectual property and you can monetize that. And so the benefits that need to be shared are all of the products that you can make because you've identified there's this scary proposed pathogen. Okay. Then they want the manufacturers to operate under, uh, I'll go back to the amendments, Article 13A, they want the director general to um, be able to create an allocation mechanism so that he could immediately determine upon the declaration of the potential of an emergency that, you know, these are the required pandemic response products that he has determined are needed and tell country A to make those products and ship them to country B. And so the other aspects of what they want to build out are a, um, a laboratory network, okay? And, and so the problem that we dealt with was this case-demic idea of well, let's do all this testing. The more testing you have, the more cases you have. Forget that they're asymptomatic and they may or may not be spreading anything. But let's scare the crap out of people because we did a, a, a test of your farm or your wastewater treatment plant or your chicken coop or your companion animal when you took them to the vet or every time you go to the doctor, we got to do a test to see if, boy, the best place to find some of the hardiest pathogens are in the hospital. They've got all kinds of antibiotic resistant stuff there. And, and so, you know, fear monger, fear monger, fear monger, they're building out what I call, I've stolen their acronym. Um, my new acronym is P-H-E-I-C, fake. It's the Pharmaceutical Hospital Emergency Industrial Complex. They want money to flow as venture capital into building out this laboratory genomic sequencing, you know, database management um, surveillance network so that they can scare the bejeebers out of everybody. There's no discussion of how do you make people healthier? How do you treat them when they're ill? This is venture capital. And again, the Indonesian health minister said the words out loud back at the B20. He was talking about what's now called the um, World Bank Pandemic Fund. It used to be called a fifth. So what he actually said is FIF, um, Financial Intermediary Fund. They get all of the nations, all of the large nonprofit organizations like Bill and Melinda Gates to put money into a big pile. And then they have intermediaries distribute it, Financial Intermediary Fund, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, so forth and so on, the WHO. And so the United States back in 2021 started the negotiations for this idea in November of 2022, they announced it. And that's when the Indonesian health minister said, Hey, everybody, he's talking to all the business people. Um, the United States has started this fifth, this world bank pandemic fund, as it's now called, it, it's ultimately going to be a $10, ten billion a year fund to build out pandemic response product manufacturing infrastructure. This is a great business opportunity, he said. Go invest. And so I don't give investment advice, but it sure looks like the growth industry 
is the industry that they use to scare the crap out of us. Let's go look everywhere for a pathogen or by whatever definition. Let's, let's scare the beejeepers out of everybody. And, oh, look at that. We've already made the products that you, you must have because under the amendments, the recommendation to have those products is now an obligation and you can't travel unless you get them. And so the, the, the documents, you know, are, are intertwined, you know, but the, the things that the treaty would seek to do are not what a lot of people have attributed to it. Thus the fact checkers give everybody a hard time. And, and so my take on it is where's the after event review of, oh, you know, we went along with what you told us to do and that didn't work out so good. And the things that you said were things we should do proved to have much more risk than benefit. So did we learn anything? Well, apparently not. What they learned is that they had trouble controlling people in impoverished nations who didn't have the laboratories and the genomic sequencing and the testing so they couldn't fearmonger as powerfully in poor nations. And they want to build out that pharmaceutical hospital emergency industrial complex so they can scare the crap out of everybody. And then they'll test your crap to see if you've got pathogens in your crap, in your sewage treatment plants. And, oh, we found polio in the sewage treatment in New York. You know, got to lock down, got to give everybody a shot. Um, it's got nothing to do with the concern for people's health. They want one health, the one health approach to give them power over every aspect of life because they're busy seeking out a, a pathogen that can then trigger an emergency and, you know, continue this cycle that we went through over the past couple of years. And John, thank you for letting me rant. I appreciate it. No, it's not a rant at all, James. And, and pathogens, of course, can be generated in the laboratory to order now. If you've got everybody sending you a whole you know, bunch of... If a vested interest wanted a pathogen with a 20% case fatality rate, it could get one. If it wanted one with a 50% case fatality rate, it could get one. And if the... If the yeah, one of the most frightening things you said there, James, was, was about the, the electronic control. And once people can control that, yes, they can control passports. And I'm just reminded of that verse in Revelation, no man may buy or sell without the number. Right. To be specific, that's not in this agreement. OK, that sort of thing. When, when they talk about surveillance in the treaty, that surveillance means doing testing at your sewage treatment plant, your chicken coop, you know, your farm, whatever. They're surveilling the landscape for pathogens. The surveillance in the amendments also um, talks about a different kind of surveillance. It's really hospital um, disease rates and deaths. It, it's, it's monitoring oh, a bu whole bunch of people in Birmingham passed away, you know, for some reason, we don't know what it is. In my view, in the UK and many other nations, they should be reporting on these abnormal, you know, excess deaths. What the heck is going on? They actually, there is a um, public health emergency of international concern. And, and the numbers that show excess disease rates spiking is exactly what they are currently obligated to report to the WHO. I would love to see the records of every nation's um, national internet. It's called the National IHR Focal Point. They're obligated to report excess disease and death numbers to the WHO. I would love to see if they're actually doing their job with what's going on right now, which we both know is happening. But it's not in the public domain if they do, is it? Uh, certainly not without a struggle. And, and so, um, John, I appreciate the opportunity to, you know, try to clarify this with everybody. No, that's good. Just a few, a few words you concern, concern me, James. Euro European Union, Saudi Arabia, India, Russia, I don't think we mentioned China, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Malaysia, United Nations. Um, all with amendments, but the UK without. It's uh, very, very telling. So, um, well, basically on behalf of uh, democratic peoples around the world, thank you.
Well, thanks for the opportunity, John. I, I greatly appreciate it. I'm going to do something that you might think is crazy, and maybe it is, but I do it every time I have an interview, is I give everybody my phone number. And so I'd like to do that now. Um, I live in the U.S., in California. Uh, the country code is plus one, and you can use um, Signal or Telegram or WhatsApp or whatever. Um, my phone number is 310-619-3055. And I, I just want to ask people to remember three words, okay? You, John, you think everybody can probably remember three words, right? Stop, screw, and exit. And so people may be offended by the word screw. I, I apologize. But um, I've collected all of the evidence on StopTheWho.com. I have collected several hundred videos from regular people around the world who have spoken out about this. You can find and watch what everybody else had to say on ScrewTheWho.com. And if you want to take action, because I think the, the appropriate action when a relationship has gone sour and someone is trying to take over control of your life, you don't negotiate for better terms. Forget the treaty. Forget the amendments. Forget the amendments last year. We reject those. It's time to exit the WHO, in my opinion. So if you go to exitthewho.com, um, you'll, you'll get actions that you can take. And if you live outside the United States, just click on the button that says Worldwide. And, and so this is a worldwide movement. And anybody who um, you know wants to... I, I, I focus on trying to give accurate, detailed answers that are backed by evidence coming directly from the WHO. I don't think I speculated too much during this conversation. I'm just trying to get people to straighten out this crazy pile of words that are coming out of the WHO. And I appreciate the opportunity to do that. Thank you so much. James, thank you. And of course, all the links will be in the description below. Check it out and uh, do what you will with that. James, we really appreciate it. Uh, I can see the amount of work you've put into this and your dedication. And um, I really respect that. And, and thank you very much for your time today. Well, right back at you, John. Thank you for all you do.